Hello and welcome to the Superior Comic Show, your Irish pop culture and comic book show with me, your host, Peter. Today we have a very special guest on. We have the writer coming back, a critically acclaimed author with her book, I believe, in a thing called Love, Maureen Goo. Welcome to the show, Maureen. How are you? Hi, thanks for having me. I am doing okay. Look, everyone uh, who knows on this <laughs> interview wants to know about Silk. This is huge for a lot of people. You know, I, I didn't realize until the announcement was made and then it was like, whoa, oh my gosh, there's so much love out there for her. That's really exciting. And how were you, how were you approached by Marvel? Um, was it just randomly one day you got an email or? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, it was one of those things where I got an email um, from Jake Thomas, who was the initial editor for Silk. And it kind of, I was like, is this spam? You know, I just, <laughs> I don't know. Did you, maybe he contacted me through my website even. Um, so I, I kind of read it and was like, hmm. Uh, you know, and I, I didn't really take it seriously for a few, like a few hours or something. And then I went back to like, wait, let me read this carefully. <laughs> um, so yeah, he approached me just through email and it, a lot of people ask like, oh, wasn't that random for you uh, since you write young adult novels and you've never written comics? But comics have always kind of been in my sphere because my husband's an illustrator, works in animation. I've known, you know, a ton of my friends work in comics. And, um, and then I worked, I worked on a book on the history of Marvel Comics uh, for Tushin, this giant book, um, which you might be familiar with. Uh, so it's never been like it didn't feel shocking or strange to be approached but it was it was like a random email out of the blue <laughs> yeah and such a, it's such a huge character as well I know before the pandemic and um, I believe it was supposed to drop in June last year yeah mm -hmm. and it was just due to the pandemic was that what kind of delayed it yes um, a lot of comics I think in general but at Marvel were kind of put on pause yeah you know it was just it was crazy um I don't really know the details but we were just told okay we're pausing this for now and to be determined and I I felt lucky because we were told um Silk was still going to come out it wasn't canceled you know yeah I was worried it might be canceled but um at the when when we were told to pause on it I had already written all five issues okay. so it was kind of like, phew, like, I'm glad we kind of got it done. All the big, all the, you know, most of the work that on my end. Um, and then it started up again last year, at the end of last year. Yeah, it's, it's, well, at least you had the issues done. So there, there's a job done just to sit on for a year. Yeah, it's funny because I'm editing some stuff right now for the last issue. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the document, I'm like, oh, it was exactly a year ago that I created this document, you know, um, and now I'm finishing it. And it's just so much has happened between then and now, but it feels, you know, I think it's a pandemic, how everybody feels. It feels like a long time and also no time. Yeah. Yeah. 100% agree. Um, it is, um, it's a limited kind of mini series. Is there a chance that we may see it turn into an ongoing? You know, I, I would never, I, I can't like definitively say yeah. yes or no, because I don't really know, but I would, I mean, I'd love for it to be, you know, um, and I don't think there's, there's no like concrete yes or no on that at the moment. Yeah. Uh, sometimes no news is good news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's still hope. <laughs> exactly. And I can, I can already tell, I've seen the buzz on Twitter. Um, I can already tell it's going to, it's going to do numbers. Oh, I hope so. I, I don't know about like comic sales and how they work, you know, and what's good, what's bad and what's good buzz. Um, and part of my personality, I'm like very anxious. So I, I try not to like pay attention to it. Much. Yes, <laughs> you know, I'm just like, I hope people like it. And oh, I'm going to close my eyes. <laughs> I've actually, I've spoken to a few writers who are, are like that and who 
honestly have been in the game for years and years and years like yourself and they don't even know really how the comic sales work, numbers work oh yeah mm-hmm. i know even book publishing which is where i come from it's very confusing like to know exactly how many sales your books have which seems like the most basic kind of information that you should have yeah. data but it's it's very comp uh, i'm sorry there's like a little beeping in the background um <laughs> It's trash day here in Los Angeles. Um, So yeah, it's very, I always feel like it's such a mystery, like who knows? Um, And what, who makes these decisions based on these numbers? And, you know, as a writer, I I think maybe a lot of creative people feel this way. We're just kind of like money, la 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 numbers. Mm Um, just is not our forte. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it just seems such a common thing. I think it's, it was Al Ewing who I was talking to who basically told me I stopped worrying about the numbers and just started writing what I wanted to write and I'll know it's doing bad if they cancel me. Exactly. It's because you can't control anything but your own work. Yeah. So it's really, I know some people that like really like to get into the nitty gritty with their sales and stuff and because it doesn't make them anxious. But for a lot of writers and creators I think we prefer to just focus on the work because truly you can't really do like what am I going to do about myself to try to sell more comics you know I just have to put it out there and do the best job that I can I think that's great I think that's actually a great piece of advice I think uh, I see a lot of the, the indie comics that you see on Kickstarter and all that have a great kind of foundation but as you get into it you can kind of see they're looking at it's almost pandering to try and make sure that they get the sales they need. And I think mm. what you said there, just doing the work and doing being yourself is the best way forward. I think it always shows in the numbers then in the end. Yeah, because I mean, I'm coming from obviously like I'm working with Marvel, so that they're they're a big machine and I I'm not involved in, you know, having to try to sell or print these things. I think when you maybe when you do your own comic and you're self-publishing yeah, you have to think about the marketing. So I feel a little more sympathy for them. But in the end, the number one thing is what you're actually making. So if you hopefully if you put good stuff out there, then it'll find find its readers. Yeah. And I think as well with writers, I think if you enjoy the work you're doing, it really shows there's certain writers who write certain characters who you can tell they really love this character and they enjoyed writing it. Oh, I hope that that people feel that way about Silk because I had so much fun writing her. I felt like I knew her the second I started it. So, you know, that's why I agreed to do it. I was like, write a comic? Yes, that is so (laughs) fun. (laughs) And it's so much less like time than writing a novel too, you know? Yeah, what is the process difference like between comics and novels? Like obviously novels are are bigger and there's a lot more substance goes into them, whereas comics, you can split it over issues. Yeah, well, um, yeah, there are quite a few differences. One being the format. Um, so it's episodic, right? It's like you're telling a story through X amount of comics, and in my case, five. So you've got to think about your story structure that way. And, you know, you want each comic to feel like a complete thing and have like an ending that'll like get the reader to want to read the next one. You know, there's like an art to, um, to the pacing of storytelling in comics. And then obviously you have a visual element. So you're not the only person responsible for this. You're working with a team and with the artist. And um, so it's much more collaborative. And then I also feel like compared to, um, compared to books, there's a lot more, more collaboration. So in books, you kind of have a lot of, uh, say as an author over the story, it's, it's pretty much your story. Your name is the only one on the cover and you kind of take responsibility for whatever you put out there. Um, whereas with comics, I, you know, you outline and you brainstorm and you pitch with, um, with your editor, or, and in my case, I had two editors, and then now um, Lindsay is the other ed- editor in charge of this. And so you've got other people who have a say, and I'm so glad, right? Because for me, I'm writing a comic for the first time, so I just want to make sure I'm not making, I'm not 
doing anything dumb or <laughs> I asked them so many dumb questions. They were probably like, oh my God. You know, at one point they said, I, I tweeted about this and I think you might've even responded to that, but the whole Marvel U thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I want to defend myself a little bit in that the context of their notes, they said something like, oh, in Marvel U, blah, 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 what happened? And I was staring at that note for so long and I was like, Marvel U, oh, it must be Marvel University. I guess there's like a Marvel University, you know, because I don't assume I know everything about comics. So yeah. I'm like, there must be a Marvel University. So I was Googling Marvel <laughs> University and I'm like, hmm, nothing's really coming up. And I'm like, let me check the Marvel Wiki. No, nothing. And then, you know, I try to do all my work before I ask dumb questions. So then I was like, well, this is like, I can't find anything. So I, I have to ask them. <laughs> and I said, hey guys, question. Cool. I can do this. Marvel University, where is it? Who runs it? Like, what's the history? Of <laughs> and then Jake was like, oh, you know, he's so kind. You know, it doesn't make me feel bad. He's like, oh, sorry. That's um, short for Marvel Universe. <laughs> And I'm like, ah, okay, yes. Yes, 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 okay. <laughs> gave me, that tweet gave me a chuckle and not because of just what it was, but because I have found myself making so many little mistakes like that when it comes to comics and terms that I'm not familiar with. And yeah. then thinking about it, I was, I was like, I would actually love to see a Marvel University comic. That, you know, I, that's so funny because several people responded to me that way. They said, Ooh, now I want a Marvel University. And um, I just thought about, oh my God, the dorm room situations and like the different classes. It's like, it'd be like a modern X-Men, you know, like uh, the school for gifted children or whatnot. But I was like, okay, I don't know if you could do a Marvel University because it would just like be every character and there's all this like, you know, but I, that was really funny. I love the idea of that, especially because I come from writing YA novels where it's a lot of like, interpersonal dramas and like romances and you know I was like oh I could totally write something fun with this um but yeah so sorry to go I totally went on a, on a tangent but um I enjoyed process, it I apologize <laughs> yeah so it's very collaborative and it's um I don't and I really like writing uh, I really like brainstorming with people I love working on a team um and I miss doing that you know when you become an author your job is so isolated and you just kind of sit by yourself and like kind of go crazy with your own brain and your own ideas and then your editor helps you at a, at a certain point but in, most of it is done by yourself and I really liked how with comics every step of the way you kind of check in with your team and then people you know you have opinions and then obviously the visual elements so I don't have to write all these details I'm just like oh I'll leave it up to tech you know mm -hmm. um uh, the artist uh, for Silk is Takeshi Miyazawa, um, who, you know, he's done a lot of great comics and I was really lucky to work with him. And so that was really great. And then, yeah, just the sheer number of words in a novel versus a comic. It's like, what a dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really, and I personally, the reason why I even said yes to this is because I've, I love writing dialogue. That's my favorite thing. So it really translates well into the comic format um, if you like to write dialogue. And that's so fun. I love writing all the quippy jokes that, you know, I love Silk's, she's kind of snarky and uh, she's funny and I love getting into her voice. Um, and then, you know, as far as like the comic-y plotting and like, it's so weird. I, I was kind of worried like, oh, I've never written a comic. I write about like teenage girls and their romances. You know, that's like my forte and their families. Like, am I going to be able to do this? And the second I started writing it, it's like a lifetime of reading comics and watching comic book movies. You just kind of know it, you know? I'm not saying that I was perfect. Like I'm sure so many things had to be fixed, um, but it's not foreign. It's like this medium that I've been surrounded by my whole life. So like, I kind of naturally knew like the, the beats of a comic and like the, the quippy little, you know, comebacks that villains will say, the puns, all of that stuff like comes right out of you, you know, or it did for me. Um, so it was such a fun process. Yeah, I think with comics in uh, 
in my opinion, the difference of like I love reading novels as well, but in terms of comics, you can be very wild with comics, especially with the imagery there as well, and the readers will eat it up. Whereas with um a novel, I think it's you can get wild with it as well, but there's some sort of, in my opinion, limitations. I could be completely wrong. I'm not a writer here. I'm just talking crap. <laughs> No, you're right. There are limitations, you know, or you have to describe everything in detail, um, which some people do really well and you feel like you're in there, but it's so cool that you can just leave it up to the artist and um, especially for things like action. It's not fun to write action, in my opinion. You know, I've tried in the past like to write like, and even in the comic, I kept trying to describe the action and I'd be like, you know what, Tech? I don't know. <laughs> like I think you're gonna think of something cooler so she's like kicking him in the air or something you know like you go wild with this I know you're envisioning something way more dynamic and cool than I can um so yeah for like a that that specific thing like action scenes um and even like adding drama you know it's just such a it's so much more cooler to be able to see a cool angle or um an action shot and uh, I just had a lot of fun every time the first round of you know sketches would come back yeah and um tack as you call him i'm gonna, I'm gonna call him that because so i know for a fact even though i heard you say his name i will still butcher the pronunciation um is an incredible artist as you mentioned and i think he's perfectly suited to the silk book with his style yeah mm -hmm. i can only imagine uh, how was it seeing your dialogue and your writing on the you page. know it the first so there's several stages where you see it i'm sure you know um yeah. you see like the the pencils first which is sketch sketches out and then you know we give feedback or whatnot and then you see the inks um and our our uh inker inkist i'm not sure what the official title is um is ian herring and he's amazing um and that's cool you're like whoa it looks so but then when you finally see it in the final stage with the actual um, lettering then it feels really real and when i saw that for the first time for the first issue like i got very emotional <laughs> you know i'm like emotional anyways but i felt this like whoa i did it this is like officially happening um it just feels very real and i'm and you take a moment and you're like, I did this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was just so cool. It just, it's like 10 billion times better than what you imagine. Um, well, than I imagine because I'm not, I don't make comics usually. <laughs> so it was, it was just really, yeah, tax art is so good. It's, and I really loved Ian's, his choices of colors. It's just really great, um, beautiful. So I felt very lucky. I had a great, first team to work on this as you said you grew up reading comics and watching the movies so as a comic fan i say it was incredible to see your name on that front cover yeah i only just saw the front cover i don't even have an issue yet um i haven't seen it in person somebody posted on twitter they i don't know how they got an early copy of the first issue and I saw it and it was the first time seeing my name on the cover and I was like, whoa, um, you know, it was just so crazy to see it with the Marvel logo. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not a huge comics person. I'm going to be very honest, but I, I've always read. So my history with Marvel is when I was very little, I used to read, this is going to like date me, but I used to read the amazing Spider-Man in my newspaper as a daily, daily comics. And that was my earliest introduction to superheroes, you know, and and um, and Superman. So Superman and Sp Amazing Spider-Man were in the newspaper. And then, you know, I really just loved the X-Men cartoon. I read all the Arch. I read Archie comics, you know, um, and I I loved watching all then you know all the superhero movies coming out. I'm just such a I watch, I gobble them up. I'm like obsessed with MCU, you know? Um, and so I don't consider myself like a comics geek or an expert or anything like that. I'm just like a very mainstream person who enjoys comics. Yeah. 
so yeah, it, even then I still felt a real thrill at seeing it because it's just such a cool opportunity. And I feel very like, I don't know. I feel very, uh, there's a lot of good feelings about it because Silk is Korean American and I never, if you told me as a kid, one day you're going to write a Korean American girl superhero comic, I would have been like, huh? <laughs> so it's very, very cool. Yeah. And this question might be, I was asked by one of our followers to ask this and he put in the description to ask it delicately. Mm. Um, we don't know how important it is that Cindy Moon is being reintroduced to fans now um, with Marvel usually reflecting the world outside the windows. And especially with what has just happened uh, over there in the US. Yeah. He's wondering if um any if there was a stronger motivation to reflect those realities in your work and were Marvel supportive of it. Well, like I said, yeah, we started this such a long time ago. Um not to say that hate crimes against Asian people just started during the pandemic, but it was certainly exacerbated because yeah. of our previous presidents calling it the China flu and whatnot. You can't really see kind of, what my eyes just rolled. Uh, <laughs> I know it's like, okay, good one. It's like a joke some fight like 15 year old would make. Um, but you know, that was our leader for a while. <laughs> um, and so the rise of the violence was, was happening certainly on my radar. Um, and, you know, I, I am someone who has never backed away from a fight, speaking my mind. You know, I was raised that way, but also it's just my personality. So yeah. in, w without the context of the Asian hate crimes, I loved writing Silk because she is someone that I relate to as someone who is protective of her family and friends, someone who has a lot of anger issues that she has to <laughs> channel into a proper, you know, and and anytime someone ever asks me, like, oh, what, what do you wish was your super, you, if you had a superpower, I always say strength because I wish that my outsides could match my insides yeah. of wanting to protect people. Um, being a woman, I'm also like small, you know, I'm, I'm not like a buff, strong woman. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I have to say I am pretty strong now because I do exercise, but like I, you know, if you saw me physically, I'm like, okay, somebody that literally anybody on the street could maybe kick my butt or so they think. So it's, it's so nice to be able to write my Korean American girl superhero that literally could kick anyone's butt and protect people. It really tapped into this, this desire and frustration that I have growing up Asian in this country and growing up a woman, always kind of like being vulnerable to violence. Um, so I had that mindset, of course, like I love, so empowering to write this character, but the comic itself was being written in the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. And so unfortunately the storyline was already done. I mean, not unfortunately, because I, I like it. I think it's great, but um, I think that if, I had been writing it right now, you know, like if I'm, I was in the middle of plotting out this series in the midst of everything going on, the comic would change um, because I, I don't know, I think it would, who knows, maybe it wouldn't, but I, I think I would have stronger feelings about certain aspects of being a Korean American woman, of being an Asian American woman in this country. So there might've been a little more attention to that. Um, but I do think that just the existence of Cindy and Silk is so powerful for representation, um, which is a big reason why I also agreed to do it. You know, um, it's a really cool opportunity to be able to write the story and to, to have, to give a voice to a population that doesn't usually get to see themselves represented as like badass superhero. Um, so it's really, I don't know. I have a lot of mixed up feelings, yeah. you know, I, because this is coming out on the heels of all this violence. And I'm like, I, I wrote this 
superhero who can save people and protect people but like in the in real in the real world it, this is so difficult and this is you feel so powerless and you feel at the mercy of like violent stupid people so what can you do um and so you know it's hopefully it'll be at least a comfort to people out there or just a fun escape and also maybe it'll make people feel good that to see someone that looks like them represented in a story where they're powerful i think actually personally i think you're underselling the impact there i think this could with the likes of cindy moon with the likes of um shang chi coming out this year as well and then with the rise of the likes of miles morales i think there's a comics and these movies are doing a great job of possibly educating the next generation coming up and hopefully can now i'm living in a perfect world here but hopefully can at least decrease some of this needless violence yeah because you know i mean i agree with you i i have that hope too and at the end of the day you know i'm writing these fun stories my job is to write fun stories right. whether it's comics or books or what have you but I think that because I write, I write about Korean Americans a lot of times, it's just a way of humanizing, you know, a group of people that maybe you don't know very well, or just normalizing too. So a big part of, I mean, sorry to get on my soapbox here, but like a big part of why Asian Americans are frustrated in the US is that we feel very dehumanized mm -hmm. and not, it sounds dramatic, but it's because people think we all look alike. People think we're all, you know, like robotic, obedient, submissive, right? There's all these stereotypes. And when you lay out a stereotype like that, or when you group a bunch of people into, and give them these characteristics, it's easy to not see them as individuals. And then when you do that, you go out and you can punch, punch an old Asian person in the face mm -hmm. because you don't see them as a person. You see them as like, something representing a group that you don't like for whatever reason so i don't know if my comic will make those jerks violent freaks decrease but i think it'll make people aware of it and hopefully keep an eye out for that kind of behavior and just educate themselves on the history of this stuff and you know and if you see an asian person they don't look foreign to you because you're used to seeing their stories yeah, I uh, 100% agree. And you, you stay on that soapbox for as long as you like. You know, <laughs> sense of, Thank you. <laughs> I, like, Cindy is incredible. She goes there. And like I said, I know um, Shang-Chi is, is Chinese. But I think it, this year, I think I could be wrong. But I think Marvel are pushing that side of it, that side of things. And hopefully, like you said, it can, it mightn't change the minds of these violent, I'm going to call them what they are, psychopaths. Yeah, uh, but it may help others step in and help where needed. And like yeah. you said, humanize the Asian community over there in America. Mm -hmm. And also just if people are just aware, I don't know, if you just tell, make everybody feel like human beings to each other, you know, there just could be a decrease in racist rhetoric mm -hmm. in general and like you know, just people passive, you know, saying, casually saying racist stuff, you know, that just maybe will de decrease. So who knows? But uh, going back to your question, actually, I felt very supported by Marvel, even if it wasn't specifically about, you know, what's been happening this week or what have you. It, um, I really felt like I had a lot of freedom with the story I wanted to tell. And um, every editor I worked with has been really great. And supportive and I've never felt like anything but um positive working with them I think it's a, it's amazing as well with the way you described how uh Cindy makes you feel as a character it's crazy because I was growing up it, with me it was Peter Parker and I still see myself a lot as I'm Peter Parker I'm not Spider-Man I'm Peter Parker I, like I look as you said like someone anyone on the street could beat up but it's funny how it's just one little spider has created these two heroes that mean a lot to so many people. Oh, I love that because 
my favorite character, I mean, before Silk, was always <laughs> Peter Parker. Uh, I'll, I don't know if I related to him like you do, but I just love the underdog yeah. feeling of him. And, you know, I, I think also I'm always drawn to teenage stories. So, you know, he was in high school and, um, and I also loved his vulnerability with his uncle and his origin story. And so, yeah, Peter and Spider-Man always. So when I got offered Silk, I was like, yes, because, you know, I had wanted to, I was like, yeah, I, I want to write a comic one day and I would love to do a Marvel comic, but, you know, didn't think that hard about it because I just have a lot of other things. But when I was given the opportunity for Silk, it was just like, oh my gosh, yes, I get to stay in the Spidey <laughs> wheelhouse and I get to write, you know, a couple of moments with Peter or um, Spider-Man, not that much, like, He's not like really a big character, but just to be able to write him was really cool. Yeah, I, I bet, and I wouldn't expect him to be a big part of it. Um, him and Cindy have had their uh, their problems in the past. Um, yes. <laughs> so I, I, he seems to be he's a crazy one, Spider Man. He seems to me that he's my favorite character. I relate to him so much. But just like me and my group of friends, he seems to really get on a lot of people's nerves. Yes, actually, I'll tell you guys a little like sneak peek. She she has a Cindy Texan on her phone, and the the way that she labels him on her phone is really funny. <laughs> so just keep an eye that. out for that. <laughs> I'll be looking out for that now. I'm feeling my partner will end up changing my name <laughs> on her phone to whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. So with so this being your first comic, you said there you really enjoyed doing it. Are you? looking to do more would you love to do more comics and dive more into the comic world I would if time permits <laughs> you know I there's so much I want to do um but because it was such a great experience I I feel very open to it and I also have some ideas and like you said I feel pretty motivated to reach as many people as I can now with my stories um with the world being the way it is, I feel a little more, more of a fire under my butt than before. Sorry, I don't know if I can use bad words on oh, this it's, show. It's, so it's, I'm like Irish. talking like yeah. I'm talking like a mom. Like, it's an Irish the show. Bottom. Just say what you like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so you know, yeah, I, I hope I have some opportunities, and I would definitely be open to it. So, um, it opened up this door for me that I. That I'm very excited about. You never know with uh, when this comes out, you could have people basically uh, trying to petition for you to stay on comics. Oh, I hope so. Gosh, I'm so nervous. I'm like, I hope you guys like it. E. So, was writing something you always wanted to do uh, growing up? Was that your dream career? This is an interesting question for me because I feel like the answer is both yes and no. Um, because so I was a huge reader. I did. I loved books. Like most people who are writers, you know, we just, all I did was read. That was like my only skill in life. I was really bad at sports. Uh, I hated sports. I hated a lot of things, <laughs> but I loved reading. Um, and I, I loved writing eventually, but my writing was more like, oh, it was, you know, in school, I was told, oh, you're, you have a skill for writing, like I'm good at writing essays or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so and I always thought, okay, if you like writing, what's a job you can do is like, I guess I'll be a journalist. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I could write books, which sounds really like, huh, how come you didn't know that? I think a lot of kids, first of all, don't think that they can write books. But two, it's, you know, I when I was growing up, there weren't any books written by uh, Korean Americans or Asians, really. I had very little exposure to that. Um, you know, I just thought, oh, books are written by like old British men or like fa fancy ladies in New York, you know? I didn't think like me, I could write a book. So it was never a job that was on my radar, but I did love writing and I knew, okay, this is like something that I'm good at, I guess. And so I thought I would be a journalist in college, but... I, once I started writing for the college newspaper, I was like, no, thank you. It's so boring to have to get facts and 
you know, like stick to the truth. <laughs> and I realized like, oh, I guess I don't like journalism. I don't really care about like current events. <laughs> I like writing. And so I just kind of, I just kind of wrote for fun on my own. I wrote like, you know, I had a blog, like everybody did back then. I, I wrote a few freelance things for magazines. Um, and then I worked at a bookstore because I needed to make some money. And I, at the bookstore, I'd always be working in the children's book section because it was just my forte. Like I knew exactly what books to recommend for people as kids. And so I thought, oh, you know, maybe I want to work in children's books. Uh, but again, I didn't think I could write them. I just thought maybe I'll be an editor. And so I went to grad school to become an editor. And then I graduated in 2007, which was the economic downturn here. And so there were no editing jobs for me. And so I just kept writing this book that I enjoyed writing. And I took jobs, you know, I took the job at Toshin here, which is an art book publisher in LA. And I became a graphic designer eventually, but I kept working on this book. And literally until the second, I eventually got an agent and the agent sold my book. But until the moment that she called me and said, hey, we sold your book. I did not ever say out loud, I want to be a published author. It's this weird thing. I think like um, I was afraid to say those words out loud yeah. and it didn't seem real. It didn't seem like it could happen. So I was like being self-protective, you know? And, um, but then once I sold it, I was like, holy shit, <laughs> I've been doing, <laughs> this is what I've been wanting to do. You know, I read a million books in my life. I worked at a bookstore. I wanted to, you know, I worked in art books. Everything was like, kind of like leading me here. But I didn't ever say the words out loud because I didn't think it was a career I could ever have. And so, yes, I, I did always want to be a writer. Um, I just didn't quite understand how or in what shape. And then it's so obvious that I wanted to write books since I was a kid. I just didn't really know it. Yeah, no, that's, we actually, I've discovered there, uh, we actually have two things in common. Um, I studied journalism as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, now you have a podcast. You are a journalist. <laughs> Pity I don't get paid. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm also uh, currently, because um, I don't have time to go back to college just yet with a two-year-old, I'm currently self-teaching graphic design. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was self-taught too. Again, we're basically best friends now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing with, you know, the internet is that you can learn all these things on your own now. It's really cool. Um, graphic design, I still love it. You know, and it was such a nice thing to be able to do while I was trying to write a book because it uses different parts of your brain, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But look at you now, as you said, you never really said it out loud. And writing is, it's a very, when you're a kid and you think I want to be a writer, you just think I want to be a writer, but it's a very broad kind of job spec. There's so many different categories of writer. Yeah. And I'm sure, like, I personally love books growing up as well. And it's just finding which, category you fit into yourself it was the young adult novels and now I have a feeling it's going to be comics too mm -hmm. yeah you know it was it was weird I didn't quite know what I wanted to write um the the whole reason why I even started writing fiction is because I applied to when I applied to grad school I also applied to a creative writing program so you know it's weird I always tell the story like I didn't know I want to be a writer and it's kind of like well, then why would you apply to a creative writing program? <laughs> but I don't actually remember why I applied to that program. It was like a weird whim. Someone told me about it and I was like, there's a program for children's book writing? You know, it just seemed like, maybe I'll try it. And you, in, in order to apply, you had to write, send them a writing sample. And I had no idea, like, do I want to send a picture book or a middle grade novel, a chapter book? Um, and back then, YA wasn't like the big category that it is now. I think they're called like teen fiction or something. And so um, then one day somebody gave me this book as a gift. And I was like, who do you think I am? Like a 12-year-old girl? Because it was called The Princess Diaries. You know The Princess Diaries now. 
but one of my favorite movies. I'm not afraid to admit it. Oh my God, it's so good. Well, you should read the books because I, in my opinion, the books are better. It was, I read the book and I was like, oh, this is what I want to write because it was so funny and, um, you know, just dealing with like, I love the high concept of her being a princess, but she's really like this dorky girl. Like, you know, I, I just loved all of it. And I realized, oh, I want to write young adult fiction. And that's what made me go into it. I give those books a lot of credit for that. Um, I think it suited my writing voice. You know, I read it. I'm like, oh, this is, this is how I naturally write. This is like what I enjoy writing. And so that's what led me to young adult novels, actually. And you've been very successful with them as well. Like it's like I was looking over, I was doing my research as you know, all journalists do. And <laughs> there is like, there was a lot of acclaim for your writing style in these young adult novels. I've seen, I haven't seen a bad word. Um, oh, like, thank you. That's all. I mean, I'm sure they're there, but I certainly don't look for them. <laughs> like uh, I believe in a thing called love uh, seems to be the most popular one and the most kind of comes up on search results as soon as I search your name. Yeah, that I would say that at the moment, that's the book that people people like the most, my most popular book. And it was so fun to write. Sometimes I'm like, is this my job? You know, I'm writing about a girl who tries to get a boyfriend using the tropes found in Korean dramas. <laughs> someone told me like, oh, that's going to be a book you get to write and someone's going to pay you for it. <laughs> I'd have been like, okay. <laughs> You're living the dream. Yeah, I, you know, I feel very, I feel lucky, obviously, and grateful that this is my job, but um, it is one of those things I always tell, especially girls. Don't just say you feel lucky, you know, you did the work, like you work to get here. So uh, your um, story there, you told me about how you came to being a writer. You worked your ass off. Yeah, it, it's so funny. I, I would have denied it up until a few years ago. You know, I would have been like, oh, no, it's just like kind of like everything happened like in my favor, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, why do I do that? You know, it's just like a, a thing. I, I don't know if that's part of Irish culture, but it's definitely a part of Oh, Korean, yeah. It's, Asian culture to be a little like you have to be humble, you know? It's big. It's it, with itself. We're kind of go from humble to bordering on self deprecating. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. No, Matt Declan Shalvey, who is an Irish artist at Marvel at the minute, um, almost stopped his, his big break from doing that. Basically, he was at a con and someone offered him a job at Marvel and he was like, Oh, I don't think I'm too good enough for Marvel and almost cost him his first gig at Marvel. Uh, yeah, it's so, it is a, often a cultural thing, you know, to not, to not take those opportunities or to have a lot of self-doubt. Um, for me, I've kind of, I've done a lot of work to not be that way. So I think I'm not really that way anymore, but <laughs> you know, it still rears its head sometimes. It does, but like what you're telling me there, you have to respect the grind. Like you grinded the ground I'm all never sure what the tense for that word is um, <laughs> yeah I think ground <laughs> ground yeah you ground your way to where you are now and you know I mean it's in my opinion from just talking to you now luck had nothing to do with it it was hard work and perseverance basically I would say that if anybody wants to do anything um is totally the common denominator of people who succeed is not talent at all. It is perseverance. <laughs> you literally just have to do it. You just have to finish. So whenever people ask me about writing advice, you know, how can I finish a book? Or, you know, what should I do? I just say, finish writing that first book because if you don't do it, then there's nowhere to go from there. Yeah. Um, and so many people that, you know, you can always get better at your craft at anything. Um, but not everybody has it in them to finish and to keep going. So don't worry about like, am I talented enough? Am I good enough? If you actually want to do it, just keep doing it. You know, that's the difference between people who are succeeding at their jobs or want it or doing the things they want. It's just the, the continue doing it. The only thing that stops you is stopping. <laughs> no, I 100% agree. It's even with myself, with the, the podcast there, it speaks to me there. 
I had a lot, I started this as a journalism assignment and I just couldn't get around it. And a friend of mine said those exact words to me. He's like, just finish it. It's for college. Only the lecturers are going to hear it. Just finish it. And that's all you can do. And then I fell in love with podcasting. Yeah, I mean, that's I have a friend who also has a podcast and that's her thing too. Like she's like, I just have to keep doing it and be consistent and hope that the audience will find me, you know? exactly not everything is gonna uh, explode if you mark it sometimes you just have to build it and they will come as they say yes I actually really firmly believe in that you know and of course there's a lot of luck involved with a lot of things like um, if you get like somebody famous tweets about it or you know whatever like that helps but if you don't actually do the work you know there's nothing there yeah no 100% you mentioned it there now and I'm sorry I, I have to ask because the the first name and because of the humbleness, is the is there Irish in your family bloodline? No, no. <laughs> but you know what's funny? I'm very Korean, but I have always felt a weird kinship with Irish culture and growing up. And I think it's because of my name. I guess I don't know what it is. But when I was younger, like my friends, my Asian friends would make fun of me. Like, why do you like Irish stuff so much? I read like every Maeve Binge novel. Like I went through like a phase where like I was obsessed with her novels. I had like a clatter ring. I had like all this stuff, you know, and I'm kind of phased out of it now. But then I read this old history of Korea book, South Korea. And it was kind of racist, you know, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, who wrote this book? It was like written in the 70s. But the thing that cracked me up was that it said, the Koreans are known as the Irish of Asia <laughs> because we drink a lot. <laughs> like that is a very stereo, like hilarious stereotype that you are basing this broad statement on. But I just thought that was kind of funny. What, what a, what a way to name. attempt to offend two cultures in one. I know, I know. <laughs> I was like, cool, I guess. You drink a lot? Rude. Um, but Koreans, actually, there is a lot of drinking in the culture. Like. <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm like a lightweight so i'm always like oh i'm a bad korean <laughs> it's, it's it's the same here it's it it's not a stereotype based on lies but you know yes but it's like only we can say it not yeah. you <laughs> only we're allowed <laughs> yeah <laughs> look maureen i don't like you've answered all my questions and and then some uh, i know silk is dropping on the 31st of yep. this month and I will, I cannot wait to pick it up and read it and start the hashtag keep Maureen in Marvel. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, I never heard of this hashtag. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get a trend and on, <laughs> we'll get you and the writers team for the Silk movie. Oh, yeah. The, well, it's a TV show. TV show. Mm hmm. I'm very excited about that. See how that goes. She has. It's been. It's. I'm actually think it's about time she got onto the, the screen. It's. Yeah, you know they say that. Oh, this random Asian girl in the background of the Spider-Man movies yeah. with Cindy. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, I you mean, just, thanks. I guess. <laughs> you just picked the one Asian girl you see in the background and said that. I know. Cindy. That's what they said. I mean, that's like literally what they say. Like, oh, Cindy's in this, um, you know, the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, which, by the way, I love. Those are actually my favorite Marvel movies. Um, no surprise, because they're essentially YA novels made into movies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I was like, OK, I'm glad she's getting her own her own show. It's, it is going to be great to see her on screen. and. Um... It's going to be amazing to see your mini series, and I'm I really am hoping for an ongoing eventually from yourself. Oh, thank you. I hope so too. <laughs> we'll see. Look, in the meantime, I'm going to let you go um, and take care of the little one. I'm sure looking for attention at this stage. Oh, I think I think he might be napping if I'm oh, lucky. You might actually get a break for a few for I'm a bit. Quiet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you too, you with your little two year old. Yeah, I'm going to run around a bit. <laughs> Look, thanks very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Oh, thank you. No, I'm. this is like the first podcast I'm doing about comics. So I'm, I had a lot of fun. And thanks for having me. 
no problem at all and if you're ever in Ireland we'll, we can go prove the stereotype yes <laughs> <laughs> I hope someday soon I can get on a plane again yeah fingers crossed we can get to go somewhere again <laughs> yes and Eb, I will be expect a tweet or two from me on the 31st talking about the book oh great thank you <laughs> I'll keep an eye out and enjoy the rest of your week and uh, stay safe you too thank you very much thank you bye, bye.